All right, so welcome to Math 355, Lecture 13. And what I want to do today is I want to talk about coding. So how would we actually use the computer and the fact that we're in the 21st century to do some of the problems? And again, I can do the problem we're going to do today by hand a lot faster than I can write the code. But as the problem gets more involved, more complicated, you want to be able to write simple code to do things. I am going to try to do the coding in as general configuration as possible to handle as many cases as possible and not take advantage of the very specific problem we're looking at so that the code is flexible. That means it's much more likely that I'm going to make a mistake. But I want each section to have at least one coding lecture. If you have any questions on what I'm doing, let me know. So what I want to start off with is something we were discussing last time. So the left is all numbers of the form a plus b root two plus c root three. The right is all numbers of the form a plus b root two plus c root three plus d root six. And the question is clearly anything on the left is contained in the right, just take d equals zero. But if I give you something on the right, can I find appropriate choices? And if you want, instead of a, b, c, call it maybe a prime, b prime, c prime, whatever. So clearly it's enough to determine, can we write the square root of six? as say negative a plus b root two plus c root three with a, b, c, and q. Can we do this? I'm just writing it as negative a because that's gonna make the output a little bit easier. It doesn't really make much of a difference. I will, right, well, let's go through and see if we can solve this. And one of the things you always wanna ask, how well does this generalize? So, I think in our section we talked about, is the square root of six irrational? Did we do that proof last time? And then you could say, well, instead of doing six, what if I gave you the square root of 15? Would that proof be similar? How do things change based on the number? So instead of two and three, what if I just took two general square free integers? Yeah. How much would things change? And for this one, you'll see it's actually non-trivial. All right, so this is the same, whoa. All right, so this is the same. I wish it would just lock. It's the square root of six plus a equals b root two plus c root three. What should I do to both sides? Square, excellent. So if I square both sides, I'm gonna get six plus a squared plus two a square root of six. And on this side, I'm gonna get two B squared plus three C squared plus two B C square root of six, right? What's the only way these can be equal? So we need B C to equal two A Oh, not 2a, just bc equals a. Oh, e, oh, equals 2a. Oh, come on. Yes. Yes. Uh, one of my favorite expressions in all of mathematics is the following, which you can read as z naught, not not. if you really want to be confusing. Yes. So bc equals a. What's the other thing we need? 6 plus a squared equals bb squared plus 3c. Perfect. And so the question is, can we solve this system of equations in the rationals? Well, for BC equals A, if either B or C equals zero, then A equals zero, right? So, you know, case one, if A equals zero, then either B or C or both are zero can show no solution. Because you know, if say b equals zero and a equals zero, then you would get you know six would have to be three c squared. So that means two would have to be the square of a rational number. So I'll leave that for you to go through that. If a equals zero, we can handle that case. So case two, a does not equal zero, so b and c are not equal to zero. So let's try to solve. So we know a 
has to equal BC. So we get A equals BC implies six plus B squared C squared is two B squared plus three C squared. Can we say B is less than C? Do we have that kind of symmetry that we can work with? You know, do B and C occur symmetrically in this equation? Can we say without loss of generality, make B the smaller one? So B and C occur symmetrically. No, they don't. They have different coefficients. One is 2B squared, one is 3C squared. We're trying to solve an equation like this. And so if I give you a related equation, um, let's take um, you know, B equals 1, C equals 2. Uh, 2B squared plus 3C squared would be 2 plus 12 would be 24. I'm sorry, would be uh, 14. Uh, B, C, B squared, C squared would equal 4. And so maybe if we try to solve 10 plus B squared, C squared equals 2B squared plus 3C squared, we have a solution to that. But I don't necessarily have the same solution if I flip the values of C and B, right? If I now take B to be two and C to be one, it doesn't work. Cannot take B equals two, C equals one. So you always wanna be on the lookout for symmetry to try to make the algebra easier. But here we can't assume that B is less than C, okay? So we have to show that there are going to be no solutions that work. Okay. Can we assume that A, B, and C are integers? Why not? So they're in Q, right? So unfortunately, we can't even assume that they're integers. Now, notice that everything, the B squared, the C squared, you know, can we just multiply through by things? Well, they're not of the same degree. I've got things of degree two on the right-hand side and degree four on the left-hand side. So if I wanted to try to you know, clear denominators, it's not clear at all that I can do something like that, right? So this is just to try to show you just how bad it is to analyze something like this. I've got to go through with all rational numbers. And because I have something of degree two over here, so this is degree two, this is degree four, and this is degree zero. If everything was the same degree, I could clear denominators. What I'll do is I'll show that there's no integers that work, but that's not enough. So we'll show no integers work. And the goal here is to just give you some ideas of how you attack problems like this. Well, let's restrict to the integers. As B and C get larger, do you think that this is going to have a solution? When B and C are large, do you think there's a way this is going to work? What are the growth rates of the different size? What's the growth rate on the left versus the growth rate on the right? It's much faster on which side? The left, because you have B and C hitting each other to the fourth power. On the right, they're only to the second power. So as B and C get large, so the right-hand side is going to be less than or equal to five times the maximum of BC squared. Because just whichever is larger, B or C, replace the smaller one with the larger one. Similarly, the left-hand side 
is going to be greater than or equal to uh, the minimum of BC squared times the maximum of BC squared. You know, I'm basically just dropping the six. Right? People are comfortable with this. It's possible that B equals C, in which case the minimum is the same as the maximum. I can, but by doing it like this, notice I now have the maximum on both sides. So both sides, I now have an expression involving the maximum squared. So notice th there cannot be a solution once the minimum of BC squared is greater than five. Well, actually, I know the left-hand side is strictly greater than, so I can even say greater than or equal to five. So no solution unless the minimum of B and C is less than equal to two. Without loss of generality, can I assume B and C are at least non-negative? When you look at this equation, can I assume that they're non-negative? Yeah, because I'm only looking at squares here. So nothing is in this equation that's not squared. So I can assume B and C. Okay, so I only have to worry about what happens if the minimum is at most two. Once the minimum is greater than two, I know the left-hand side is larger than the right-hand side. So now I can break things up into subcases. So we're studying six plus b squared c squared equals two b squared plus three c squared with zero less than equal to b c less than equal to two integers. I'm oh, sorry, minimum of those. less than equal to the minimum of BC less than equal to two and their integers. All right, so what are the possibilities for the minimum? Okay, so let's do subcase uh, one, the minimum of BC, what can the minimum be zero? Well, if this is zero, then A is zero, and we've already handled this, right? Already done. Already done. But you know, let's be explicit. And again, my goal today is to just show you how I methodically approach this problem. So what's the next subcase? So now the minimum of BC equals one. How can we have that happen? So we have a sub subcase, right? Sub subcase one is B equals one, and then sub subcase two, C equals one. Are these subcases mutually exclusive? No, they could both be one. So let's take B equals one. Do you see how I'm putting in a lot of information? Rather than trying to solve the general equation, I'm reducing myself to lots of cases where I have more stuff at my disposal. So now that I have B equals one, this gives me, I have to solve six plus C squared equals two plus three C squared. So that's the same as four equals two C squared. So C squared equals two, no solution. In the other case, it's gonna be six plus, since C equals one B squared, equals two B squared plus three. So then I would get three equals B squared, no solution. So now I'm at subcase three. Now, this is the advantage of being able to erase. Do you like calling these subcases one, two, and three, or would you like to relabel? 
It's, there's something even better than ABC, I think. Subcase. What would be better than calling this one, two, and three? Zero, right? Because if I call it subcase zero, one, and two, I'm actually now labeling it based on what the minimum is. Instead of subcase one and subcase two, I could do subcase B, subcase C, whatever. So subcase two, there's two subcases to the subcase. So it's sub subcase one, and what would that sub subcase be? So here, this is the case where the minimum of B and C equals two. So what would sub subcase one of subcase two of case to be. B equals two. And what's the other sub sub case? That would be C equals two. So if B equals two, I would get six plus four C squared equals B equals two. So that would be eight plus three C squared. So I would get C squared equals two, no solution. And if I look at the other one, I would get six plus and C equals two now would be four B squared equals two B squared plus 12. So I would get two B squared equals six. I would get B squared equals three, no solution. And now that we've handled all of those, now we're done because we know that once the minimum is at least three, the left-hand side is larger than the right-hand side, there's no solution. So we've just shown we can't write the square root of six like this. Unfortunately, that's only for integers. So I'm basically channeling my physics mentor from my undergraduate days who believed quite strongly that at least once in your life, you should see a painful calculation so you appreciate theory. Hopefully you are now appreciating the theory. This was just to handle the fact that we don't have an integer solution. What might be better is to actually go back to the original equation and rather than trying to write the square root of six, maybe we should put in another number in front of the square root of six so that we can have all integers. So might be better to study, say, uh, you know, you know, um, r square root of six equals negative a plus b root two plus c root three, then clear denominators. So everything is an integer. So things would be a little bit more complicated because I would no longer have just the square root of six becoming six. I would have you know, one more quantity, but then I would only be working with integers. So for extra credit, see if you can make this work. I have deliberately not thought about it. I've only thought about the integer case, but the rational case is very hard because I can't clear denominators. I have things of different degrees. For the integers, there's not that many integers that are at most two and positive, or at least non-negative, right? Was it pleasant to go through all the cases and subcases and sub subcases? No, but it wasn't horrible. And there was a finite number and I know when it's gonna end. But with rationals, there are infinitely many rationals less than two in absolute value. I can't do this in a finite amount of time, but if I can clear denominators and now work with rationals, okay. So that's something that I want you to try to do, see if you can make that work, okay. So now what I want to do is let's assume that we find either that there is no way to do it, or we just want to investigate more involved uh, expressions. So now let's consider 
a number of the form a plus b square root of 2 plus c square root of 3 plus d square root of 6 with a, b, c, d rational. And then the claim was, you know, we were calling this q square root of 2 square root of 3. You know, this was the set of all numbers of this form. And the claim is that this is a field. So if I give you a specific element of q square root of 2 square root of 3, i.e., say, you know, a plus b root 2 plus c root 3 plus d root 6, it has an inverse alpha plus beta root two plus gamma root three plus delta root six, so long as what? Right, so long as it is not zero. So it has to have an inverse of that form. So we know how to solve some things like this. You know, if I give you something in the form, um, you know, example, you know, three plus, you know, two square roots, uh, let's not do two. Let's do three plus, you know, five square roots of two. And I want its inverse. We know how to solve that, right? What should we do? Yeah, we, we, we rationalize, so it's three minus five root two, three minus five root two, and then this will give us downstairs, we're gonna get nine minus uh, 25 times two is 50. Upstairs, it's gonna be three minus five root two. So nine minus 50 is 41, negative 41. So it's negative three over 41 plus five over 41 square roots of two. And you can check and see that if you multiply, it works. What if I give you uh, one minus the square root of two plus the square root of three plus eight square root of six? And I wanna find the inverse of that. Do you have any idea what you should multiply by? We're going to have so many cross terms, right? So I want to talk about how would we actually find an inverse to this? Now, to some extent, I don't have to find something that multiplies to one. It's enough to find something that multiplies to an integer. Why would it be enough to find something that multiplies to five? Then we can just divide by five, right? All I have to do is find something that multiplies and makes it an integer. Okay, but even making it an integer is gonna be a challenge. And so I wanna talk about how would we do this? Because we need to do this to show that it's a field. If we can't find inverses, we're done. Now, we know it has an inverse in the real numbers, right? This is a real number, it's fine. It's not zero, fine. But how do we show that it has a inverse of this form? So here is where things get interesting. So assume I give you some number, uh, let's call it, I'm just trying to keep track of what letters I might want to use later in the day. Let's call it u equals some number from a plus b square root of two plus c square root of three 
plus d square root of 6. Imagine f of x equals 0 has x equals u a root. Or maybe instead of u, let's use the letter r. Let's use r for root. So what would it mean if x equals r is a root? So x minus r factors. So I've got something of the form, let's call it, you know, alpha k, x to the k, k goes from zero to n. Now I've got some polynomial. So we want to say that x minus r is a factor. It also means that the sum k goes from zero to n of alpha k, r to the k equals zero. Without loss of generality, let's assume f of x does not factor as the product of two polynomials. If it did, say f of x equals f1 of x times f2 of x, since we are in a field, you know, the rationals, f of r equals zero implies f1 of r equals zero or f2 of r equals zero. So could study a smaller degree polynomial. So the book talks a little bit about when a polynomial is reducible. You know, when can I factor? Well, if I could factor my polynomial, if r is a root, it's got to be a root of one of them because the rationals are a field. There's no divisors of zero. If I was looking in the clock group z mod 12z, would this be true? Is it possible for something to be a root where the function factors? You maybe the first factor gives you three and the second factor gives you four, right? The clock group Z mod 12Z has divisors of zero, right? So this argument here would not work in a ring where you have divisors of zero, but because the rationals don't have divisors of zero, if F of X equals zero, if F split, then either f1 of r is zero or f2 of r is zero. So I could look at something small. Maybe they're both zero, but I could look at something smaller. So we will assume that this has the smallest degree, degree with say f of r equals zero. So there's nothing that has a smaller degree. So is everybody comfortable that my polynomial can't factor? Everybody happy? What can you tell me about the constant term of this polynomial? Could the constant term be zero? Good, constant term alpha zero is not zero. If alpha zero equals zero, then we can write f of x as x times, you know, maybe g of x. Because if the constant term is zero, then every term is a multiple of x, I can factor out the x. So I can write, you know, alpha n x to the n plus dot 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 plus alpha one x plus alpha zero equals zero. I'm sorry. I'm not using x, I'm using r. With alpha zero not equal to zero. So I can then write alpha n r to the n plus dot 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 plus alpha one r equals negative alpha zero with alpha zero not equal to zero. So what can I do on the left-hand side? What do you notice every term has? 
And ah, so I can write r times alpha n r to the n minus one plus dot 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 plus alpha one equals minus alpha naught. Have we found an inverse for r? Yeah, so now if we just look at negative alpha n over alpha naught r to the n minus one, minus dot 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 minus alpha one over alpha naught equals one, here is the inverse to r. So if we can find a polynomial where r is a root, we can now find an inverse. And that inverse will have the coefficients in the rationals. So this is giving you the power of being able to look at these polynomials that have this as a root. So if I give you a number of this form, I have to find a polynomial where this is a root. And if I can find such a polynomial, we're done. So you know, the first one, we were looking at, um, say the root was, I think, was it three plus five square roots of two? Can we find something where this equals zero? When you see three plus five root two, what do you want to do to it? Square. square it. So what's r squared going to be? That's going to be nine plus 25 times two is 50 plus 15, 30 square roots of two. So it's 59 plus 30 square roots of two. At this point, I'm beginning to regret you're choosing such large numbers, but... So if I looked at R squared, I have 59 plus 30 root twos. Can you think of any way to get rid of the 30 root twos? Well, remember R is equal to three plus five root two, R squared is I'm trying to find a polynomial involving R, R squared, R cubed. Do you think R is going to need a polynomial of degree two, degree three, degree four? What do you think it's going to need? What kind of polynomial do you think this is going to be a root of? What degree? Probably degree two. So maybe some multiple of R squared plus some multiple of R plus some constant. So R squared is 59 plus 30 root two. How can I get rid of the 30 root two? Well, look at R, R is three plus five root two. How can I get a 30 root two from R? Times six. So if I subtract off six times R, that's going to give me 59 plus 30 root two minus 18 uh, plus 30 root two. So this is gonna be 59 minus 18 is 41. So what, what should I do now? I should look at r squared minus 6r minus 41. So here is a polynomial with r equals 3 plus 5 root 2 a root. And now you could try to look at you know, r times r minus 6 is equal to 41. So r times uh, 1 over 41 r minus 6 over 41 would equal 1. And try to see, you know, does that work? So what did we get earlier? Hopefully this matches. Here we had negative 3 over 41. r is equal to 3 plus 5 root 2. There's the, this is looking pretty good. 
Yeah, we've got the three minus six. So hopefully that will all work. Another th approach is we have r is equal to three plus five root two. I could look at r minus three is five square roots of two. So r minus three over five is the square root of two. So r minus three over five squared equals two. So r minus three squared minus uh, 50 equals zero. So r squared minus six r plus nine minus 41 equals, so we get the same polynomial. I was able to do that and just you know quickly get through things. But again, as the root becomes more involved, this is gonna become harder and harder and harder. But what I did is I knew that some combination, hopefully of one R and R squared would work. And so I calculated R, I calculated R squared, and I tried to see, was there a way to combine things? So now it's time for the advanced part of today. So let's do things in as much generality as we can. So consider R is gonna be A plus B square root of M plus C square root of N plus D square root of M N. M and N say are square free and distinct integers. I wanna to try to find a polynomial that has this as its root. I could choose specific values of A, B, C, D, M and N, and that would make the algebra a little bit easier. I'm gonna to try to risk doing it in as much generality as possible so that we can write a really good computer program. Okay. So this is a chance to review uh, some ideas from linear algebra. And so, when you look at something like this, this looks like a vector with how many components? Four. So looks like a vector with four components. Now what's nice is when you look at powers of R, it's also gonna be a vector with how many components? If I look at R squared, R cubed out of the fourth, out of the fifth. Four. Yeah. And so notice, you know, R squared is going to be A squared plus M B squared plus C, I'm sorry, plus N C squared plus M N D squared for the first component, right? What's the square root of two component, what's the square root of M component going to be of R squared? And how many times do I get AB? Is it AB or is it twice AB? Does everyone see it's gonna be twice AB square root of M? When you FOIL it, when you multiply it by itself, I could have the A hits the B root M, or I could have the B root M hits the A. Is everybody comfortable that it's two AB root M? Is there any other way I can get a square root of M term? Yeah, the C root N can hit the D square root of M N. And so then that would get me a two N C D square root of M. What about the next one? How can I get a square root of n term? It's gonna be a two AC root n. And now I could have B root m hits D square root of m n. So it's gonna be two B D m square root of n. And then the last one is going to be um, how do I get a square root of mn? So I can have 2bc square root of mn 
plus D, I'm sorry, plus AD, so twice AD. Yes? Is everybody happy with this? But how, how can I keep a square root of MN? Oh wait, oh, is there something else? Is there something we're missing? I'm sorry? Well, no, if we have D squared, the MN vanishes. There is a term that we missed. The B root M could hit the C root M. Oh wait, we, oh no, we already did that. We already did that. Oh no, no, this was right, we were right. I think this is it, right? If I want to get a square root of MN, I either have A hits D root MN, or B root M hits C root M. How many terms should there be when I expand out A plus B plus C? Plus, you know, there should be 16 terms, right? I've got four times four. And if you count the coefficients, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I have 16 terms. I've counted all the terms. All the terms go somewhere. So I can represent R as the four vector a, B, C, D. This is you know the constant. This is the square root of M. This is the square root of N. This is the square root of MN. And I can correspond to R squared. It would be a little bit more involved. It'd be A squared plus M, B squared plus N, C squared plus M, N, D squared. Then the next one would be two A, B plus two N, C, D. The next one would be two A, C, plus two B, D, M. I'm doing everything correctly. Uh, I, guess, I guess in the other places we've written the M earlier. Let's do this as M, B, D, M, B, D. And then the last one would be two B, C, plus two A, D. And so I can have a vector like this. Everybody comfortable like this? Yes? What about R What about R squared? We just did that. What about R cubed? Do we agree that it's something, 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 something? And what about R to the fourth? Also something, 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 something. All of the powers of R are gonna be like this. So really, and then there's one other vector that's worth studying. What would the vector one correspond to? One, zero, zero, zero. So if I look, these, live in, we're working with the rationals, so I'll say Q4. And I have five vectors, one R, R squared, R cubed, R to the fourth. What do we know about these? So what must be true about these five vectors? So they all have the same setup of four components, but what do you know about five vectors in Q4? They're linearly dependent, right? I have too many components. So there must be some combination. So maybe um, alpha zero one plus alpha one R plus alpha two R squared plus alpha three r cubed plus alpha four r to the fourth equals zero. Is it hard to find out what those alphas are? So again, you, you have to imagine that I have told you what A, B, C, D, M, and N are. 
And if I tell you what these are, then we can calculate what is the vector r, what's the vector r squared, what's the vector r cubed. It's just, I'm trying to write things in a concise notation. What is one of the prerequisites for this class? Wouldn't it be nice to actually use the material you were taught? Right? That there's a reason why they want you to take linear algebra before doing abstract algebra. One of the points of linear algebra is to represent things in a way that's easy to manipulate and work with. And so by corresponding these to vectors, the hope is that this is gonna be a little bit easier for us to work with. And so now there's going to be some combination of all this that should vanish. If alpha zero is zero, what would happen? Well, if alpha zero is zero, so you know, case one, if alpha zero equals zero, then we would get you know, maybe r times alpha one plus alpha two r squared plus alpha three r cubed plus alpha four r to the fourth equals zero. And then since r is not zero, then we would get alpha one plus alpha two plus, I'm oh, sorry, r squared plus alpha three r cubed plus alpha four r to the fourth equals zero. And we can keep doing this and eventually we'll get a polynomial. So keep doing and eventually get a polynomial with r as its root. Yes? For the case one line, shouldn't alpha two to two r has an exponent one less? Oh, yeah, yes. Um, yes, they, they should all be one less. Yes, you're absolutely correct. You are not being silly. I am. Um, I did not decrease the exponents. Thank you. So this should be r, r squared, r cubed, r, r squared, r cubed. Yes. And then if alpha one is zero, then we would pull out r again and we could keep doing this. So eventually we get a polynomial. So in your case two, if alpha naught is not zero, then we get um, alpha one r plus alpha two r squared plus alpha three r cubed plus alpha four r to the fourth equals minus alpha naught. So we would then get r times alpha plus alpha two r plus alpha three r cubed plus alpha four, no, sorry, r squared, plus alpha four r cubed equals minus alpha naught. So let's divide by minus alpha naught. So we get minus alpha one over alpha naught, and then minus alpha two over alpha naught, minus alpha three over alpha naught, minus alpha four over alpha naught. And we've now found the inverse for R. So what I hope you can begin to see from this is that we now have a procedure to actually find the inverse. We just have to find a polynomial that sets it equal to zero. And so we checked this by looking at a quadratic irrational, you know, uh, three plus root five, I think it was, or two root five, maybe three plus root five. So, you know, we, we chose something that was a little bit meaty. I didn't choose, you know, one plus the square root of two. I chose something that had decent numbers. And so what we can do now is we can just write a computer program that will find the linear combination. Is it hard to find a linear combination? So 
So again, now we get to do some linear algebra, right? So linear algebra digression. I'll call it review. So given vectors v1 dot dot dot, you know, v n plus one in let's say qn or rn, how do we find the linear combination that vanishes with at least one coefficient non zero. And of course, if one coefficient is non zero, there has to be at least another one. So we're trying to solve, you know. Alpha one v one plus dot 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 plus you know alpha n v n plus alpha n plus one v n plus one equals the zero vector with the alphas in all of zero. Right? So one possibility is assume a solution exists with alpha n plus one not equal to zero. Without loss of generality, what can you assume alpha n plus one is? One. So without loss of generality, we scale so that alpha n plus one equals one. And now we want to solve alpha one v one plus dot 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 plus alpha n v n equals v n plus one. Well, that's the same as I take the matrix, you know, v one dot 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 v n times the vector alpha one alpha n equals v n plus one. When is this going to be solvable? And how would you find the solution? So we need to solve for the alphas. How would we find the alphas? So instead of writing, you know, this is v1 dot 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 vn as uh, column vectors. How would you view this collection of v's? What? How would you represent this? It's a systems of equation. So, what would you use for writing that thing with the v's? What notation would you use in linear algebra? This is one of the most fundamental things you try to solve in linear algebra. Something, we'll call this the x vector, we'll call this the v vector. What would go in front of the x? A matrix, right? This is just solving a matrix equation. This is our a, this is our x, this is our, oh, instead of b, v, do you often use, I think, I think you often use b, you often use b. And then this would be the b. We're just trying to solve a matrix equation. How do you solve that? If you're trying to solve AX equals B, if you want it to be. So if A is invertible, then X is just A inverse on B. And that's how we can solve things. If A is not invertible, then we have some trouble. But you know, you can you can handle cases like this. What I'm, what I'm hoping you're seeing right now is how 
you know, math 250, how linear algebra is useful for what we're doing here. So what we need to do is we need to create this matrix. We need to find the inverse of this matrix. And so to do this, we need to have our five vectors. One of the vectors is particularly easy. It's the vector one, zero, zero, zero. The other ones are gonna be more involved. So this is where you know, I am torn as the professor. Do I want to do things in full generality and have these monsters? Or do you wanna give me specific values of A, B, C, D, M, and N? We can do it like that. And then you can see later that you could generalize it. That in principle, it's not gonna be that much worse to do things in general. But to just, for a class where we haven't really done much coding, to just keep things a little bit simpler, I'm happy to choose values for A, B, C, and D. Do you want to do that? All right, let's do that. Okay, so let's take, uh, do you wanna do one minus the square root of two plus the square root of three minus the square root of six? You know, trying to keep things as short, simple, sweet as possible. So this means R would correspond to the vector uh, one, I'm sorry, one, negative one, one, negative one. And I'll put a transpose here. So now we have to figure out what would R squared be. And so everyone agrees we can just multiply things out. And then we have to multiply things out for r cubed and out of the fourth, right? Let's talk about a faster way of doing things. So let's imagine I take something of the form, um, I take my r and I multiply it by something of the form a plus b root two plus c root three plus d root six. So I've got one minus square root of two plus the square root of three minus the square root of six times a plus b root two plus c root three plus d root six. What's the constant term going to be? It's gonna be a So it's gonna be minus, not minus B. Well, no, but we're looking for the constant term. No root twos, no root threes, no root sixes. Oh, minus, two. minus two B, the negative root two hits the B root two and it's gonna give us a minus two B. What about the root three? What about the root threes? I could have root three hits C root three. So it's gonna be plus three C. And I could have minus 60. That's my constant term. What about my root two term? Well, to get root two, I could have negative root two hits A, right? Is there any other way? I could have the B root two hits one, right? So I think it's gonna be negative A plus B. Is there any other way to get a root two? two. So the square root of three could hit d square roots of six. So that would give us three d root two. So I could have a plus 3d, right? The other possibility is the negative square root of six could hit the, the c root three. And that would give me a minus 3c. Is everybody happy with that? So if the, my, if the square root of three hits d root six, that's going to give me d square roots of 18, that's going to be three d square roots of two.
Okay. And then instead of writing it like this, I'm actually going to write it in a slightly different order. No, I'll, I'll leave it. Like, I'll fix it later. Let's now think about how can we get a square root of three term. And so if I want to get a square root of three term, I could have the one hits the C, right? I could have the A hits the square root of three. I could have the negative root two hits the D root six, right? So if the negative two hits the D root six, that's going to be uh, negative two D. And then the last is I could have the negative root six hits the B root two, and that's gonna be negative two B. And then the last is how can I get a square root of six? I could have the one hits the D root six is gonna give me a D. I could have the A hits the negative root six, so I have a minus A. I could have the root three hits the B root two, so it's gonna give me a plus B, right? And then the last is I could have the negative root two hits the C root three and give me a negative C. So is everybody comfortable that this would be what would happen if R hits an arbitrary vector A, B, C, D? It turns out I can represent this as in a matrix form. So here's my matrix A, R. Here's my vector A, B, C, D. And I can write this, I'll call it maybe A sub R. And this is going to represent how multiplying by R would work. What does the constant term go to? It goes to A negative two B plus three C minus D. What should the first row of this matrix be? I wanna get A minus two B plus three C minus six D when I hit it with the vector A, B, C, D. What should, good, one minus two plus three minus six. For the second row, I want to get negative a plus b plus three d minus three c. What should the second row be? Minus one, one. No. Minus three, three. This is why I wanted to rewrite things because I wanted, I wanted to go in the order a, b, c, d, not a, b, d, c. What about the next row? It should be one for A, minus two for B, one for C, and then minus two for D. And then the last row, it should be minus one, one, minus one, one. And so now, if I wanna calculate, you know, R, R squared, R cubed, I can just take this matrix and apply it. That's a lot easier. And you know, the vector R corresponds to you know, one, negative one, one, negative one. So I can just apply A to R to R squared to R cubed to R to the fourth. So again, I'm, I'm trying to show you how to use linear algebra to make things a little bit easier. Okay, so hopefully now this is displaying. Yes. So let me make the matrix A, um, try to make this a little bit larger so we can see it. Is that, is that large enough people can see or should I make it larger? All right, so my matrix now is going to be the first row is one, negative two, three, negative six. The next row is negative one, one, negative three, three. The next row is one, negative two, one, negative two. And then the last row is 
negative one, one, negative one, one. And it's nice that I actually have this in front of me. And then matrix form of A, and that should be our matrix. And then I can look at, let's let R represent the vector. It's gonna be one, negative one, one, negative one. And then A dot R, let's see, did we calculate R squared? I don't think so. So we can look at, one minus the square root of two plus the square root of three minus the square root of six. We can square that and I'll do expand. So expand is a great command in Mathematica that says just do out all the multiplication. And we have 12 minus eight root two plus six root three minus four square roots of six. So I'm constantly checking to make sure have we done any mistakes? I now have this matrix A. I can use this matrix A to calculate R, R squared, R cubed. So the first vector R is one, negative one, one, negative one. So if I want to, I can call that my vector V1. So let's let V1 be the vector R. What should the vector V2 be? R squared. So the matrix A multiplies by R. So that should just be a dot r. What should the vector v3 be? So it's, I could do it as a squared on r, but there's something better. What have we just computed? We've just computed r squared. a dot v2. You know, do as little calculation as possible. What about V4? What should that be? A dot V3. And so when I do my calculations, you know, here, oh, I put um, semicolon suppresses the output. So here are my vectors. Now I want to form a matrix where R is the first column R squared is the second column and so on and so on. I don't know how to do that very easily, but I can make a matrix B where it's going to be B1, B2, B3, B4. And let's do matrix form of B. And if I scroll down, there's I right, so it's got things in parentheses. So I'm a little worried about that in terms of is it properly viewing things. But this isn't quite the matrix I want. What do I need to do to this matrix? Take the transpose. Okay, so well, I can easily do transpose. I'll take the transpose of this and I'll call that B. And so now let me see if I can actually calculate things like the determinant of B. Now, okay, so it's, uh, so unfortunately it is viewing these not as numbers, they're in parentheses. I'm trying to figure out why is it putting them in parentheses? Oh, let's see. I don't want these in brackets here. Okay. It was viewing this as like a major, okay. So if I do it like this, I think that should fix it. Let's see, or did that make it even worse? Nope, all right. So I'm Right, so, that, so that's what, so, that, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna open up a second window right now 
and then just do question mark is, is help. So there's something called vectors. So vector represents the domain. I can click on local, which will give me, you know, local help. And so it will give me something about just, you know, a basic vector. So just, you know, three, three, three. So I'm wondering if uh, the issue is that this should just be transpose, but I tried that. Looked like it would. Okay, so um, I think it, so. Let's see. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write print made it here. So, okay, so it is calculating. So it was calculating a dot r correctly. And so there's some small typo, unfortunately. Um, print. And so this just lets me know, you know, just how far I've made it before I get an error. And so it's calculating all those stuff correctly over here. So the, the problem is when I'm creating um, the matrix B is I just haven't created the matrix B correctly at this point. Um, and so I wonder if maybe I just need to remove the brackets. I'm sorry. If I, if I come down here, if I write V1 and V2, it's definitely regarding these as things. So maybe let's do it like this. Okay, now, now it's working, okay. And so I think now I just need to do the transpose. So now let's just, let's C equal transpose B and then take the determinant of C. Oh, C is protected as a universal constant, wonderful. All right, um, I don't think we've used M yet. Use M for matrix. Did I put a semicolon after? Oh, 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 no, okay, it, it's, it's, it's working. Here, and the determinant is 32. So now we have our matrix. And so how would I find the inverse of the matrix? I would just type inverse of M. If I scroll down, there's the inverse of the matrix. And now what do I need to multiply the inverse by? Um, I think the vector was one, zero, 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 something like that. I'm not even gonna bother doing that. If I, if, I, if I look just down below at the matrix, if I do one, it's just gonna be two, four, one, negative one, four. All right. So I'll let you finish the details, but this shows you that we can actually go through, we can do these calculations, we can find the polynomial, yeah, we did it for specific choice, but if you want to make things even more of a nightmare, the key insight was we created this matrix A. And when we had that matrix A over here, that allowed us to go from R to R squared to R cubed. We just have to find that matrix once. And those coefficients will depend on what you come in. So those would just become functions. So hopefully this shows you the power of being able to do coding, that we can now solve all stuff like this. All right. So this is a good place to stop. Have a good rest of the day. Have a good spring break.